everyone. Welcome to Live with Susie show from my home studio. This is our first show coming to you from Century City in California. I'm Susie Katami, producer and host of the show, and I'm thrilled and excited to introduce you to the lovely author from Great Britain, the place that I used to study and live when I was a kid and a teenager. And every time I hear this lovely British accent, I can't help it. I just love it. <laughs> so this is Louise Price. She's an author. Welcome to the show, Louise. Thank you very much. And Louise has been to our motherland. She's been to Iran, not once, not twice, three times, guys. So if you are like <laughs> me and haven't been to Iran and miss it, there you go. She has all the latest to share with us. So it's lovely to have you. And I know you've been so busy being in Los Angeles lately with all these book signings, which I was honored to be in one of them presented by you. And you did a marvelous job. Well, thank you very Talking much. about your Merci. book and your experience in Iran. So um, to start with, I know Luis worked for BBC. And um, at a very young age, rather, she decided that enough is enough. I want to go <laughs> and see the world. Now, what came to you to make such decision? Yes, yeah, so I was working at the BBC, not in journalism, but in the music department. Um, and that was my background. I'd worked in the music industry in London. And I got to about the age of, I don't know, 28. And I suppose I thought, like people do, there must be more to life than sitting behind a desk. You <laughs> right. know. It was a good job and I enjoyed it. But... I had itchy feet. Uh, I just passed my motorcycle test. So Good I learned to ride you, a motorcycle. <laughs> uh, so just, I just did that for fun. And I think the two things together, a bit of a boring job, sitting behind a desk all day, looking out of the window, seeing the planes flying and the motorcycles whizzing past, and then learning to ride a motorcycle. It was like a kind of a light bulb moment came mm -hmm. over me and I had this idea, right, I'll, I'll go and see the world, but on a motorcycle. Good for uh, so, you. What an exciting <laughs> thing to do, really, for ladies. I mean, we know men uh, yeah, ride quite motorbike. Unusual and, even then, yeah. yeah. So how did it happen that you chose, first of all, with your first book, Louis and the Go, and you decided to go on, uh, from our, um, um, Alaska. Alaska to Argentina. all the way to Argentina? How did that come about? <laughs> I'm just so curious yes, reading all well, this about Well, it's a good you. question. Um, I, so I didn't really have any kind of... Um, sense of where I wanted to go. I just sort of wanted to see the world, but I did know that I wanted to incorporate the USA mm -hmm. because I, I just love a lot of American music and literature and art. So um, that was a big deal for me. I wanted to come to the West Coast uh, and ride, you. yeah, and ride down that wonderful uh, highway run down the Pacific Coast. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I'll I'll do that. And I thought, well, I probably can't afford to go around the whole world. So I'll do half of the world. So I looked at the globe and I thought, well, if I start at the very top of the Americas. And and then I ride to the very bottom of the Americas. That is literally halfway uh, around the globe, north to south. Pretty well. And pretty much, except for a tiny bit at the top and the bottom. I right. didn't get to Antarctica, but I got as close as you can get. How long did it take you? On I was travelling for 10 months. Wow, that was yeah, long. Yeah, okay. so I gave up my job completely and I sent my motorbike to Alaska and I flew in and picked it up and then rode all the way down to the very tip of South America. And okay, so after that trip, you decided to write a book about it, yeah. right? And that was your first book yeah. that you published? Yeah. When was that now? Um, the trip was in 2003. The book came out by the time I got home and wrote it, uh, it and ended up being published 2007. I mm. see. Okay, now after that, Louis decided that it's not going to stop. So she wants to continue <laughs> no doing way. more of those kind of a trip. So where did we go next? So yeah, I got home and all my friends and family were like, oh, well, you've got that out of your system now. They thought I'd just go back to normal life. But no, I think once you've done something like that, you get it in, you know, in your blood. So mm -hmm. I rode from my home in London to Cape Town. So to the very tip of South Africa. Wow. And, so and how was that Africa. experience? That was absolutely incredible and just there were some terrifying moments really exciting I mean it's impossible to be bored in Africa so it was um, much shorter than the other journey mm -hmm. half the distance 10,000 miles right. and the journey through the Americas it was 20,000 miles and it took me about four or five months to do the Africa trip but mm -hmm. it was absolutely incredible experience <laughs> I rode through the Sahara Desert oh my goodness um, and then down through the Congo Angola and then eventually arrived in Cape Town and thought oh, 
few. Wow. <laughs> you were glad it was over at the end? Yeah, I mean, I was really glad I did it. When I look back on it now, I realise it was probably the toughest thing I've ever done. Physically, emotionally, everything. It was draining, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. but really quite, I mean, a truly thrilling experience. God bless you. And then that <laughs> came your second book being published exactly, by that yeah, trip, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then eventually, Louise decided to do book about Iran but before that she took a trip and now how did that trip come about it's interesting to hear yeah it is a funny story so I had my motorbike which had been to Africa and it looked all messy and kind of like it'd been around the world which essentially it had mm -hmm. and I parked near the uh, British, uh, near the Iranian embassy in London um, and this was at a very bad time between uh, in, uh, British and Iranian relations. Okay. What year was this? Okay. November 2011. I mean, obviously, we have a very long history, unfortunately, with Iran um, that goes up and down quite a lot. And this That's was very right. much a down period. Um, so the, the sanctions had been imposed on Iran and uh, there were uh, protests and riots outside the British embassy in Tehran. Uh, so they closed the embassy, expelled all the... Um, British workers from the embassy. Mm -hmm. And then in the typical sort of diplomatic tit for tat, all of the Iranians were sent back from England. So we were at this kind of impasse wow. where there was no diplomatic uh, relations between our two countries at all. And it was quite bad. You know, in the press in England, they were talking about going to war with Iran and there, and there was a kind of, of in, you know, the general public were in favour of that. So it was quite scary. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't know very much about Iran at the time, but I parked my bike quite near the um, embassy. I was uh, daring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was all closed up. There was no just a guy there with a gun, you know, just like that was all. Uh, all the doors were closed. It was all locked up. But I was just visiting my brother who lived nearby, mm -hmm. um, worked nearby. I came back to my bike and there was this note on it from a, a guy, I don't know, his name is Habib, but I didn't know him. But I thought, well, that's funny because sometimes... Like in, in motorcycle world, we kind of know each other's bikes, we recognize mm -hmm. each other. And I thought it must be someone I know, but it wasn't. And he said, oh, I like your bike. It looks good, you know, like you've traveled a lot. Have you ever been to Iran? Please don't believe what you're reading in the mm -hmm. news at the moment. We are not terrorists in big capital letters. Aww. And I was like, oh, that's uh, sweet, but a bit weird and funny. And I didn't really think any more about it. But then as the news progressed, I started taking more of an interest because of this note. And it said, you know, come to Iran, you'll find we're oh, very welcoming nice. people. Yeah, and I thought it was a really peculiar thing to do until I actually got to Iran and realised actually it's completely normal. <laughs> <laughs> and that all the Iranians are like, very welcoming. So and, you found uh, the Iranians to be normal after all. Exactly, okay, yeah. good to know that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and this is something I heard over and over again in Iran mm -hmm. was, we're not terrorists, we're not terrorists. And they were very aware of how they're viewed in the rest of the world, how Iran is viewed. And they were very keen to put that right and make that clear to me. Yeah. And they were so welcoming. Anyway, so I, 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 after reading this note, I kind of thought, well, maybe I should go to Iran because I'm always up for another motorcycle adventure. Yeah, you like one of those ladies. I need an like inspiration. Challenges, yeah. inspirations. And, and I thought... And why not? Yeah, exactly. And then I thought, well... Why not? That was a good question. And I thought, well, the reason I wouldn't do this is because I'm scared. It sounds scary, the idea of a British mm -hmm. woman on, on a motorbike alone in an Islamic country, because we're led to believe in Britain that this would be a dangerous, scary thing. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, I knew from my other travels that the only way to find out for sure is to go and have a look for yourself. Absolutely. So I thought I'd better do that instead of just sitting at home thinking about being scared. I better go and actually have a look. And Good of course, for you. Yeah, and it was just the most magical experience. Really so was. what year was it that you decided to actually finally go to Iran? By the time I Iran? got there and I got my visa and everything, which was quite difficult, uh, 2013. Okay. Then I loved it so much that I left my motorbike there and went back again the next year. Good for you. Yeah, you made so many friends. I did, I did. In the book, reading <laughs> the book. That, it was amazing. That's amazing. And most people in Iran, I hear that they do speak English. So the language wasn't a barrier. The language was wasn't it? a problem, actually. I, I mean, again, I didn't know what to expect. I mean, when I arrived, I realized this kind of revelation. Oh, my God, I can't read a single sign. <laughs> I can't read the number plates. I can't read the shops. I don't know if that's a restaurant or a dentist or anything. <laughs> like, what terrible. do I do? <laughs> I mean, I had my book, you know, I had a right, fancy right. English book and I was trying to work it out. And, oh dear, you didn't no. use your Google Translator? No, because you see, okay. the phone... Or that didn't work there either? No, no, oh. couldn't connect to the okay. phone or to the uh, banking system, so I couldn't use my credit card. Oh my so God, so you had to carry all carry that all cash? Carry all my cash. All those... Oh yeah, my all tucked in my underwear and everything. <laughs> oh God. Okay, so you travelled a lot of cities in Iran. I did, yeah. Uh, from north 
yeah. uh, all the way to south, exactly, right? Yeah. How did you find Iranians in different regions of Iran as you travel? It's really Were they different. Yeah, it's funny you should say that because everywhere I went, they would tell me about the next town. They say, "Oh, the Esfahanis, you got to watch out for them. <laughs> oh, the Shirazis are really lovely. They're really nice." That's where I'm from. <laughs> yeah, so you got to watch out. <laughs> They were right, obviously. Right. <laughs> so it's funny that people had these kind of stories. But um, I mean, my overwhelming impression was that people were just so welcoming to, to me as a foreigner. They were surprised to see uh, at that time there, there was no tourism. Like I think, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's really got much bigger now. But so to see um, a woman particularly alone on a motorbike with obviously a British license plate, I stood out a mile. I, I couldn't. Bet. I could not be anonymous. So everywhere I went, whether it was just like um, you know the the shepherds and the nomads, or right. or the truck drivers, or be, you know uh, really high up businessmen in Tehran, or just a little lady working in a in a shop or something. You know, everybody was friendly to me. That's and nice to hear. That's and they nice. would invite me back to their homes and come and have tea and meet my mum and have dinner Aww. and stay with my brother who lives here and my cousin who lives here. And that's how I ended up really just kind of getting passed around Iran by all these different people. Any particular favourite spot in Iran? Well, I did really love Shiraz, and I'm not just saying Thank that. you. No, I read that in your book, so yeah. I know you're not just saying it. It because... was a lovely place because it was, very, it was uh, I think, more relaxed, and, and, and people were really friendly, um, even more so than maybe than anywhere else. I remember walking down the street and people just saying, hello, hello, yeah. hello, you know, and just talking and... I went to Aram Gardens, uh, oh, which is really beautiful, beautiful and very, very relaxed. Yeah. Uh, and of course, to Hafez's tomb and all of these places. And I heard in your book you mention about Hafez, which which is why I put the book yeah, out there for you. Oh, that's beautiful. And, uh, so I've got an English translation of his poems at home. That's so, lovely. Yeah. So talking about Iran and Louise traveling uh, throughout Iran, we do have a clip that I'd like for you to take a look at, and we will continue our interviews momentarily. Stay tuned. Iran aggressively pursues these weapons and exports terror. I see the impact and influence of Iran everywhere. An Iranian military leader threatening to kill American generals. It's an axis of evil. I can't read any of the road signs, and road cycling here is pretty heavy. But I've had such a warm welcome from all the Iranians I've met so far. Everyone's waving and smiling and giving me the thumbs up. But this is a big country, so if I want to discover the reality of life here in the Islamic Republic of Iran, I'd better get going. <laughs> My route took me 3,000 miles from the mountains of the north to the deserts of the south, through remote villages, bustling towns and the sheer madness of Tehran. As the days rolled by, my overwhelming impression was of an undeniably modern, industrious country underpinned by a rich ancient culture and a strong sense of identity. But what really stood out was the genuine warmth and kindness that radiated from everyone I met, again and again and again. Iranians make it very easy to hang out with them, even if you're supposed to have given up smoking. The effortless hospitality was wonderful. But of course, travelling as a woman in Iran comes with its own challenges. My hair has to be covered all the time here. So obviously that's fine when I'm riding with my helmet on, but when I stop and want to get off the bike, I have to quickly whip off the helmet Make sure my hair isn't showing and do the swift shuffle from helmet to hijab. Although I was footloose and fancy free, sadly, Iranian women are not so fortunate. But despite the situation, the women I met were lively and inspiring and I asked one of them about this. Her answer was simple. That situation makes you strong. 
Of course, uh, women in Iran don't, uh, don't have a very good situation. They, they're laughing, they do everything, they are very uh, talkative and <laughs> uh, they are not very conservative people. One of the thrills of life on the road is never quite knowing what's going to happen each day. I was literally plucked off the street and invited into the home of Ahmad and his wife Mariam. And I wondered, why would he help a complete stranger? I expect people to be kind. Human being is a human being. It doesn't matter you're Christian, doesn't matter you're Muslims. I think we need to help each other, uh, no matter uh, what your religious is. I won't deny it, I did have some trepidation about coming here, but thank heavens I didn't listen to all that stuff I saw on the news and that I didn't listen to those people back home that said, Iran, what do you want to go there for? I've had a great time here, so if you do get a chance to come, please take it. I'm so glad that I did. Okay, we're back with Live with Susie and Louise Price, the British author who's talking about her experience and traveling to Iran. And as a result, she came up with this great book called Revolutionary Right. Uh, you can purchase this book from Amazon. Amazon, all good bookshops, as book they say. Yes. I like how you put it because <laughs> she wants to, you know, help out the small bookstores. Exactly. And, uh, business people who are you know trying hard to make ends meet why not good exactly. for you i appreciate that it shows a good heart from you uh, every which way you look we at we got it. to support the book Absolutely. all the book uh, i love that about authors. you seriously oh. i only met uh, Luis and had the pleasure of meeting her a couple of times while she's in los angeles but a really really a nice person oh, and no wonder you. everyone in iran <laughs> liked you and welcomed you no seriously i mean it is our trade and as a nationality yeah. that we grew up to like foreigners yeah per se unlike like some countries that they don't like foreigners and as a foreigner you're always like threatened oh boy I'm not like you know uh, I'm a foreigner here but in Iran foreigners generally speaking had a lovely time mm -hmm. even before the revolution yeah, took yeah, place definitely. and I grew up in Iran I remember every foreign nationalities who would come to Iran mm -hmm. the Westerners they loved it we, we really enjoyed having them oh, um, that's and sweet. one of the ways we would welcome them was throughout our Persian dishes <laughs> and I oh, hear yeah. you like some of them <laughs> such as I love Fesenjun. Fesenjun, okay. Uh, gourmet sabzi. Of course, gourmet sabzi. Who and doesn't Jadik. love gourmet sabzi? And Jadik, of course, yes. So, so tell us a little bit more now that we saw with our viewers the uh, clip that you showed us. And I know all the good stuff had happened to you, but I'm sure there were times that you had some rough moments, especially reading the book. Because when I talked to you and you talked about Iran, it was all about good stuff because you're such a nice person. You're all positive. But I'm sure there were incidences that they weren't so nice. There were some difficult um, moments. I bet. And I'm not surprised, actually, no, because course. when you talked about it all being positive and 100 percent, I'm thinking, can that be true? <laughs> Can I be that 100% proud? Not 100%, you know? no. But then but when I read it? the book, I realized, well, there were moments, and I'm really not surprised, because that can happen everywhere. Sure. And I, it's not just because I'm Iranian and I'm trying to kind of say, you know, mm. we in Iran are everywhere you have good people, yeah, of bad course. people, of uh, course. people who are troublemakers. And I personally here living in LA don't dare mm. going to certain areas sure. uh, on a bike or a car or anything, really. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I can understand. But Tell us, I mean, take us through those uh, so, fearful moments. Yeah, so I was very nervous before I came because there are, um, obviously, as you will all know, a, um, incidents of uh, foreigners being arrested in Iran for mm -hmm. often just something like taking a photo in the wrong place True. when they didn't realise. So as soon as I arrived, I was uh, fingerprinted and taken to the police station and I was there for a long time and I thought, oh my God, I'm never going to get out. <laughs> I haven't even arrived, you know, I've only just arrived. I haven't arrived. Even arrived here. <laughs> exactly. So that was quite unnerving. And I think that just generally the immigration people and the, um, and the uh, policemen found it really peculiar that I was there on a bike. They couldn't understand it and they were very suspicious of what I was doing mm -hmm. because they didn't really kind of grasp the concept of just motorcycling for pleasure or taking a road trip 
uh, overland travel in that way. There has to be an agenda. An agenda, an exactly. To do things. So, exactly. So they must have thought I was a spy disguised as a motorcyclist or something. <laughs> anyway, so I got a bit nervous then, but they let me go. So that was fine. Um, but I did have a, uh, there were two really, um, I suppose, unpleasant incidents. One, I was driving through Tehran, leaving town, heading south towards mm -hmm. Kashan. And, um, and these guys were behind me in a car and they were driving into me on purpose for oh. fun, like trying to push me wow. off my bike, like ramming my bike mm -hmm. over and over mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. So I sort of turned around and stopped and sort of said, oh, you know, stop, you, you know, Get off damaging me. my bike, yeah. But what they didn't realise was that the car in front of me was a friend of mine, a oh. British Iranian that now lives in the Tehran. So he saw something was going on, he got out, and he's like, okay, I know these guys, these are Ahmadinejad's guys, these are like uh, Basiji kind of... Uh, right, right. Or Troublemakers. Guys. Yeah, either. yeah. He could tell straight away by looking at them from their clothes they're wearing, the, mm -hmm. the rings and stuff. Well, obviously, I wouldn't really understand those things so right. well. So he just kicks off like oh, proper God. Iranian argument. <laughs> And they're all out the car and they're all like shouting in. And I honestly thought it was going to turn into a big punch up. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was pretty scared. And then I started joining in, which was not really advisable, to be honest. But, you know, I'd been pretty well behaved until then. And suddenly I kind of well, lost sometimes you, you just have to go like, crazy. Yeah. Yeah, so it was massive shouting, screaming match kicked off. And all the cars on this, you know, this freeway have all stopped. Everyone's watching, shouting. All the women are joining in too, yelling at the guys oh and goodness. sticking up for me. And, oh, my God. So that was pretty scary. I bet. And then, you know, my friend was just seeing me off out of town, just showing me the route. Um, uh -huh. Well, good the, thing they did that. Yeah, I know. Oh, boy. But then he left me, you know, uh, I was heading for the kind of Persian Gulf Highway, mm -hmm. and, uh, and he said, hey, bye, you know, and I was like, oh, now oh, I'm God. on my own. <laughs> and I'm a bit scared of those guys, they're going to come after don't me, you know. You. So that was a bit worrying. And um, then the other time, it was an incident just with a, um, a guy that was running a gas station. And it was really in the middle of nowhere in sort of desert. But on my way to Shiraz, I'd been in the Zagros Mountains and I was coming out of the mountains in this really rough area, which then people told mm -hmm. me later, um, there's a lot of people like cooking meth there and it's pretty oh, bad kind of yeah, drugs, know, drugs and stuff. Yeah, addicts. of course, you know, you don't really know until you, you get of out course. there. I was running out of gas and I had to fill up. So I got to this petrol station at last. I was like about to run out. And this guy was running this station. As soon as I went in, I knew that there was something trouble yeah he had a look in his eye he's behaving oh strangely and normally when I go to fill up I get off the bike and sort of stretch and move right, around right. you know just because I've been sitting for all day and this time I had this really strong feeling do not get off the bike just something stay. Wrong. yeah you yeah. because I think when you travel alone you get this very it's a honed sense uh, of, of you just instinct of what yeah. people places I thought, stay on the bike. So I said, Ben's in, you know, pointing at the thing. <laughs> One of the very important word for me on the cinema. And he just was sort of behaving strangely. And then he just lunged at me. Oh, my God. And nearly top, topped me off the bike. And I was like pushing off. And in the end, I had to stand up on the foot pegs. And Poor kick. thing. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh. And then, I'd, I mean, this is where travelling by motorcycle really is so useful because you just start the engine and drive and away. And off you go. Yeah. Yes. So I was just able to whiz up. I mean, obviously I was running out of petrol and then I was really worried because it's getting dark. Where was the next bit? Well, I had no idea and I had to oh keep stopping and asking people, trucks terrible. and people. Yeah, in the end I got a couple of guys. When I was reading me. your book and I got to that <laughs> part, I was scared. Yeah. <laughs> Sitting <laughs> reading about it for you and I'm like, oh my God, that's terrible. Yeah, that was bad. Wow. But, you know, I mean, like you say, there are plenty of people in Los Angeles, yeah, London where London, I live, yeah. that would behave like that exactly. and who knows what their story is you know and why well, they've the got fact to that, that you state. came out of the country sound and safe yeah, and managed to write exactly. this wonderful book for us <laughs> as a memoir and it's lovely really i mean I'm you brought you like, like so many good memories for me reading your book oh, and good. made me feel closer to my motherland yeah. i mean i haven't been there more than 40 years oh, really and wow yes and and it just felt well, i'm really very, glad yes thank you so much no, for taking us and people like me iranians who haven't been to yeah. Iran and on this nice journey that you took. And I wish you all the very best. I know you have some com coming up events and places in England. Yeah. If you want to talk about it, please go ahead because it's going to go everywhere. Oh, on the social okay, media. sure. People yeah, hear about yeah. It. I'm doing a few talks this autumn. 
um, at various book festivals. My website is Lois, L-O-I-S, that's my first name, Lois on the Loose. Mm -hmm, exactly. <laughs> so I'm, well, on the, yes, I'm on the loose on the, 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 the screen so people can follow okay. your website. So, um, yeah, so I'm doing some book festivals and hopefully I'll be coming back to Los Angeles next September and doing some more events. Super. Super. So looking forward this. to having you back in Love LA. To see and thank you, you so thank much you. for this great interview. Oh, thanks so okay. much.